Hello, this is Meng Jiayan. I am a final year PhD student in UIUC and I'm working with Professor Joseph Trellas. I'm broadly interested in many hardware security problems and I have spent multiple years looking into side channel attacks and defenses. This video is a short summary of my PhD work and a little bit about my research philosophy. I'm so happy that you opened this video and I hope you can enjoy watching it. I will talk about how to design modern secure processor hardware to defend against side channel attacks. Nowadays, security has become a, a key design consideration in modern systems. Modern systems can be very complicated. Here I visualize it into three, three layers. On the top, we have software application, and we have host operating system and a hypervisor in the middle. Hardware is located at the bottom. Attackers are very smart. They always exploit the weakest point in the system and uh, exploit it. Therefore, we need to provide full system stack protection and enforce security policies at every layer. Therefore, we see a lot of efforts to make the application bug-free, and we see the operating system provide isolation between different processes and uh, virtual machines. However, Hardware side channel attacks can bypass all these software security policies, and even worse, it can leave no trace because it exploits the transient status of the system. In a, in a side channel attack, attacker steals information, for, information from the victim by observing how the victim uses shared hardware resources. Such resources can be floating point unit, cache, and network on chip, and many others. My work focuses on a very important type of such attack called cache-based side-channel attacks. And we call it cache attacks for short. The goal of my work is to design secure processor hardware to defend against cache attacks. When working on this topic, I have designed multiple defense solutions and I also proposed new attacks. On one hand, I look into speculative execution attacks, such as Spectre, Meltdown, and Foreshadow. I propose the NVIDIA Spec. This is the first hardware defense solution against these attacks, and this defense solution is robust to future attacks. On the other hand, I also look into shared cache attacks, such as Prime Probe and Flash Reload. I propose the Sharp. It's a practical defense solution to work on inclusive caches. And I further extend attacks on inclusive cache hierarchy to non-inclusive ones. On the side, I work on detection solutions. Re one is replay confusion to detect cache-based cover channel attacks using Raccoon replay. I also designed cache telepathy. This is an attack using existing attack strategies on new applications, such as deep neural network inference. Here is the outline of the talk. The first part, uh, in the first part, I will give technical details about Invisi spec, and the second part is a summary of my work on shared cache attacks and defenses. Let's start with the first part. I will give a short background on speculative execution attacks using the example of Spectre vari variant one. It is also called array bound bypassing attack. Here we have the victim code, which contains one branch and two load instructions. This branch will take an argument x and check whether x is smaller, smaller than the size of array 1 or not. If x is smaller than the size of array 1, then x will be used to index array 1 and get an element from it into val. The second load instruction will use val to access array 2, to index array 2. Targeting this victim code, the goal of the attacker is to read arbitrary memory from the victim's address space. How can attacker do that? First, the attacker train the branch predictor to be taken by giving this branch a, lot, a small x many times. Then, the attacker triggers the branch misprediction by giving a large and malicious x. Now, array1x is out of the bound of array1, and 
it can point to anywhere in the victim's address space, potentially. Potentially, it can point to a secret value, and the second load will convert this secret value into an address. And when performing the second load, this load will leave side effects in the cache. All these two loads can happen before the branch misprediction is detected. In the third step, attacker use cache-based side-channel attacks to figure out what address has been accessed by the victim, and the address will be the secret value. From this example above, we can know that speculative execution attacks, they exploit the side effects of instructions on the path that will be squashed. This makes attack very difficult to attack and very scare, uh, difficult to defend and very scary because squashed instructions cannot be reasoned about by programmers and the compilers. To better understand the problem, let's define some terms. First, we define transient instructions. These are instructions that are speculatively executed but are destined to be squashed. In the example from last slide, this two, last slide, these two instructions, two load instructions, are transient instructions. And the speculative execution attack exploits side effects of transient instructions. Even though we have many fancy names for different speculative execution attacks, but by the nature, their only difference is the way they create transient instructions. Let me give you some examples. Inspector attack, attackers create transient instructions via control flow misprediction. In meltdown and L1 terminal fault attack, they create transient instructions via virtual memory exception. Also, in speculative store bypass, a transient instruction is created when a load address is aliased with the prior store address. I have to mention that I designed and verified the speculative store bypass attack with my collaborator before we submit the paper, which is before the attack was firstly announced. So the question is, can we defeat all variations of speculative execution attacks? This is a very tricky question because we do not know all variations of them. Just to give you a sense of how many of these attacks are there and how quickly and fastly people discovered them. When I was working on this project, which is just uh, two or three months after the Spectre meltdown was discovered, we only knew about Spectre and meltdown at the time, and the world is still shocked about them. Just four months later, after we got the review results of this paper, there are many more other attacks. Which, such as foreshadow attacks, Spectre RSB attacks, speculative store bypass attacks. So you can see these attacks keep coming out. But it's very important for us to define, design robust, de robust defense solutions even against the future attacks. That's why we propose the futuristic speculative attack model. In this attack model, we consider an attacker can exploit any speculative load instruction which means all the load before they reach is the head of ROB. And here I will list more examples that we can use to create chains and instructions. In addition to the three events listed in last slide, we think chains and instructions can also be created because address alias between two load instructions, memory consistency model violations, and also interrupts can be used to create chains and instructions. I need to mention that this is not a complete list. If we design our process in a more aggressive way, there will be more events can be leveraged by attackers to create chains and instructions. But our definition is comprehensive that any speculative loads can, load can be exploited. It is comprehensive in the way that it, 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 include, it includes all existing attacks and the future speculative execution attacks. In this work, I designed InvisSpec for two attack models. The first one is this comprehensive futuristic attack model, and the other is a Spectre attack model, which is more familiar to people. In Spectre attack model, we consider transient instructions is, are only created by control flow misprediction. 
After we have all this definition, let's look at the lifetime of a load instruction. A load is ready to be issued to the memory when the address is resolved. Then it executes until it reaches the head of ROB, then it can retire. During this period of time, the load is speculative. And in, two, in different attack models, the lifetime of the load instruction can be slightly different. In spectre attack model, the load starts as unsafe. When I mean it is unsafe, when I say it is unsafe, I mean it is it can be exploited by attacker to convert into a transient instruction. In the spectre attack model, it can reach a point when all prior branches are resolved, then the load becomes a safe load. While in futuristic attack model, this point comes much later. Just as before it starts as unsafe. It becomes safe only when the load becomes unsquashable. Typically, this point is almost the same as the retirement point, but in the paper, we describe several conditions that we can make this point a little bit earlier than the retirement point. We call this two point visibility point. The visibility point is the point when the load changed from unsafe load to the safe load. After we define the visibility point, we can know we know that the naive solution to defend against a speculative execution attack is to delay issuing the load instruction until its visibility point. But we all know, but we all know it is not a good solution because it loses a lot of performance benefit from speculative execution and it can cause a serious performance overhead on modern processors. Therefore, we propose in this spec. The key idea is to make unsafe loads invisible in the cache hierarchy instead of delaying it. This is the lifetime of the load instruction, and in, in this spec, we will issue a, an invisible load request for the load when the address is ready. This invisible load re request will, obtain the, will get the value for us, and the instruction can obtain the value and proceed to use it. After the visibility point, we will make this load visible in the cache. We can achieve good performance because we allow speculative loads to be issued as early as in the conventional processor. How can we make the load invisible? Here, I have a multiprocessor chip cache hierarchy. To issue an invisible load request, we will send the request from the core to the cache and the DRAM, but we will not change any cache states. This includes cache occupancy state, whether the line is uh, whether the line is in the cache or not, cache replacement information, the LRU bits or MRU bits depending on which uh, replacement policy you use, and the cache coherence information, whether the line is in exclusive, shared, dirty state or not, and also we do not change the the, the presence information in the TLB state of the page containing this cache cache line. When this request returns, we will bring the data into the speculative buffer. This is a new structure we designed, which is not visible to the other cores in the system. And we will also put the value into the register so the dependent instructions can use it. How can we make the load visible? We will make the load visible when at the visibility point, and the hardware will issue a second normal load request. This second normal load request will change the cache states for us. So it seems it's very easy to mitigate speculative execution attacks. It seems like that. However, we cause a problem here. And it's a serious problem. After we issue the invisible load request, and before the second normal load request completes, this is the window of invisibility because the load is invisible to the whole cache hierarchy. We need to do that for security purpose, but during this window of invisibility, the processor cannot receive invalidations for this, for, for, for line, for this cache line. And this can cause memory consistency violations. In the next few slides, I will describe why we have this consistency violation problem and how, how to solve this problem.
I will describe this problem by using an using an example under TSO, Total Store Ordering Memory Consistency Model. The example is, we have processor 1 execute two load instructions. It checks the log to see whether the log is free or not. If the log is free, then it proceeds to, to access a counter, a shared variable counter, and uh, update it. It is a very common piece of code in multi-threaded applications when we have multiple threads uh, uh, operate, up, updating a shared variable and we use log to, to prevent them enter critical sections simultaneously. When execute these instructions in an out-of-order call processor, many things can happen. For example, processor 1 can issue the log first, but the log takes a long time to return. Processor 1 issues load counter, but the counter returns fast. After the counter returns, before the log returns, there are several, several things can happen. For example, it, it is possible that there is another processor. It writes the counter and releases the log. In a conventional processor, in an unsafe conventional processor, when the other processor writes to the counter, the coherent system will send invalidations to all the shares of the counter. However, since we do not issue the since we issue the counter in an invisible way, we do not register P1 as a share in the system. Therefore, the P1 cannot receive an invalidation. However, when the log returns, it will return the latest value of the log. Then P1 will see the P1 will see the log is free. So it will proceed to use the old value of the counter. This will lead to incorrect execution. And the incorrect execution happens due to memory consistency violation. How can we solve this problem? We propose to use validation. We will use validation when the load reaches the visibility point. The validation contains several steps. First, the hardware issue will issue a normal load request to cache to change all the cache states. We will do that for log and counter in order. Then, when the data comes back, we will put the data into the cache. And in addition, we will compare the data, the incoming data, which is the latest up-to-date value in the cache hierarchy, and the one in the speculative buffer, which is the one we used during execution. If these two values match each other, then it's fine. We can retire this instruction, such as what we will do for lock. But if these two values do not match, such as for counter, they will not match. Then we know that this load instruction may violate memory consistency model, and we need to squash it, and we need to re-execute it. So we, when using validation, we can detect Memory, memory consistency violation, and we can solve this incorrect execution problem. However, we introduce another performance problem because validations may cause a processor stall. How can this happen? Because we need to wait for the response for each validation to return to decide whether to squash or commit the load instruction. And this waiting will cause the processor stall. Therefore, we propose a cheaper operation called exposure to relieve this performance problem. And we designed this exposure operation for these loads that we know for sure will not violate memory consistency model. Let me give you a simple example. Here, P1 has a single load instruction in the load queue. Therefore, when we execute this load instruction, it will not reorder with the other load instruction. Even if we have another processor updates the value of x after we obtain the, the value, uh, after p1 obtains the value, it will still be fine because it executes x. We can execute the, the multi-threaded program as if load x happens much earlier than write x. It's not a memory consistency violation. Exposure is much cheaper because we will issue exposure when the load reaches the visibility point. The second, the normal load request will change all the cache states for us. And we do not need to wait for response and no comparison, no comparison is required for this load. Which means at the point we send out the exposure, this load instructions is allowed to be retired. 
And in, by doing this, we do not cause the processor stall. And in the paper, we provide more details about when to use exposures and when to use validations. Now, let me give you a short summary of InvisSpec. InvisSpec can provide a good security guarantee because we can successfully prevent attacks in both Spectre and futuristic attack models. I also need to mention that we can carefully define the visibility point for even more different attack models. It can obtain good performance because we allow speculative loads to be issued as early as in the conventional machine. It, we can apply InvisSpec to both single-threaded and multi-threaded processors because we fix this memory consistency problem. Finally, we do not require any software changes. However, it does come with some performance overhead. One of the performance overhead comes from the double accesses. For an unsafe load instruction, we need to issue an invisible load request for it, and also we need to issue a validation or, exp and, or exposure when it reaches the visibility point. The second part of overhead comes from the stall due to validations. However, we find many validations can be converted into the cheap exposure operation, and most of these validations hit in the L1 so they can return very fast. So overall, the performance overhead is not that much. Now let's review the performance evaluation results for our InvisSpec under different attack models. We report average execution time for spec and parsec and normalize it to conventional insecure baseline. When dealing with Spectre attack models, the naive solution is we can delay the load instruction until all, until all prior branches are resolved. It is as if you insert a fence after every branch. This can incur 1.74 performance overhead, while in this bag can bring it down to 1.21. When dealing with futuristic attack model, we need to handle a much wider broad range of a much wider range of attacks. And the naive solution is to delay load until the until the load becomes unsquashable. It is as if you insert a fence before every load instruction. This can incur around 3x performance overhead. And in this back can bring this down to 1.72. I know these performance results are not perfect, and my current and future work focuses on reducing performance overhead for InvisSpec and the other defense solutions against the speculative execution attacks. There are two directions I'm currently looking into. The first direction is to use software techniques such as compiler or program analysis to figure out which instructions really need the protection from InvisSpec so that we can selectively enable in this spec to reduce performance overhead. The other uh, direction is to design taint tracking mechanism. You can also call it information flow tracking mechanism for speculative execution. Now let's start the second part. This part is about my work on shared cache attacks and defenses. I will describe my work uh, sharp and the director attacks. I focused on a very popular type of cache attack called eviction-based cache attacks. In this attack, the victim's, the victim's access pattern on a target address can leak information, and the attacker's goal is to observe this access pattern on the target address. So how the attacker can do that? Generally, an eviction-based attack cycle contains three steps. The first step is attacker will evict the victim's line out of the cache. Now the line is in the DRAM. The second step is the attacker will wait for a while. The victim may not access the line, so the line will still be in the DRAM, or the victim will access the line to bring this line back to the cache. In the third step, attacker will using some measuring techniques to figure out where the line is located in this case, it will figure out whether the victim accessed the line or not. These three steps will be repeated multiple times so that attacker can get a trace of victim's access on the target address. And using this trace, they can learn some information. Depending on how the attacker uh, performed the eviction operation, the task can be classified into two categories. 
The first category is called conflict-based attack, uh, which means the attacker created the attacker triggered the eviction by create cash, creating cash conflicts. Some examples can be prime probe, eviction reload. The other type is flush-based attack, where the eviction is caused by the CL flush instruction. Some examples can be flush reload and flush flush. During my PhD, I have worked on several aspects of the eviction-based cash attacks and defenses. And when I trained these projects together, I find it becomes a story of a security architect's life. And let's let's talk about this story. When I was when I started this topic. Just like many other PhD students, I read many papers and I also implemented some attacks listed in the last slide. I find most of these attacks are very effect are surprisingly effective, and they are more reliable and robust and, and more reliable and accurate than I expected. But I also observed something that all the conflict-based attacks at that time only work on inclusive caches. Why? Here let me show you a simplified two-level caches in the inclusive cache hierarchy. We have L1 is private and L2 is shared. The victim and attacker are on different cores. Initially, the target address is located in the private cache of victim and it's also duplicated in the L1. When attacker tries to evict this line using conflict-based attack strategy, it will find a, a group of addresses that maps the same cache set as the target address, which we call eviction addresses. When the attacker accesses enough eviction addresses, it will create L2 cache conflict, evict the target address out of L2. And because the cache is inclusive, the corresponding L1 copy will also be evicted. We call this line inclusion victim. Because this line is evicted because the since the cache wants to maintain inclusiveness, not because conflicts. And inclusion victim is important because it is the key for attacker to gain visibility into the victim's private cache. Based on, based on this observation, I designed a SHARP. SHARP is short for Secure, cache Har Secure Hierarchy Aware Cache Replacement Policy. The key idea is that I design, I, I change the cache replacement policy to elim, eliminate inclusion victims. And I show that Sharp can be can effectively defeat again, defend against cache attacks on the inclusive cache hierarchies. More details is provided in the paper. After I presented Sharp in ISCA, Intel announced their new processors, Scalic X and Scalic SP. These are new server class processors with non-inclusive Lasso cache. So since I have emphasized how important to create inclusion victim to perform a cache-based side channel attack, it is very natural to think that non-inclusive cache much, must be more secure against the cache attacks. And that is what people think. There are multiple art articles in several technical log uh, blogs. One of them is New Intel CPU cache architecture boosts the protection against the side channel attacks. And they are, to some extent, they are correct. The presumption is, if it is on a non-inclusive cache, the attacker will lose the visibility into the victim's private cache. And why? Let's use the same example from uh, inclusive cache. We change the inclusive cache to non-inclusive cache. The biggest difference is that in this non-inclusive cache, the two, the target address used to duplicate in both L1 and L2, now it will not be duplicated. So the copy in L2 will disappear. In this case, no matter how many evictions, eviction addresses attacker accesses, there's no way to create a conflict on the target address. No conflict, no inclusion victim. So no visibility into the victim's private cache. So it's cool because we are living in a safer world. However, as a security architect, I started thinking, is that really secure? Because we haven't really tried to attack it yet. 
this leads to another of my work, directory attacks. The key idea is, no matter what cache hierarchy it is, inclusive, non-inclusive, exclusive, the directory is always inclusive because we use the directory to store presence and co coherent state information for all the cache lines in the whole cache hierarchy. It is deemed to be inclusive. Since the directory is inclusive, we can exploit the directory conflict to create inclusion victims and perform conflict-based cache attacks. I also want to mention that direct directory attack is a generalization of previous cache attacks because in the inclusive cache, when you attack the cache, you are also attack the directory. Based on this idea, I designed the first prime and probe and evict and reload attacks on, the, on Intel's latest sliced non-inclusive cache hierarchies. Now I will show the reverse engineered results of the directory structure in Intel's Garlic X processor. In this Garlic X processor, the loss of cache is organized as multiple banks, or you can also call it slice. Within each loss of cache slice, the cache line is organized as data array. For each data, for each cache line, we have a directory entry and a tag entry for it, organized as traditional directory. We call it traditional directory because we also have it in inclusive caches. And according to, reverse, according to our reverse engineering result, we find there is another structure called extended directory. This structure is used to store information for lines in private cache, but not in the loss of cache. This structure is also set associative. And this structure is the new attack surface can be used by attackers to create prime and probe and evict and reload attacks. And please refer to the paper for more details about how I designed these two attacks. So the story of a security architect's life does not have a happy ending because my work on directory-based attacks uh, just prove that, uh, prove that, that non-inclusive cache is as vulnerable as inclusive caches. By looking at this diagram, I think it is a good summary of my PhD work on cache-based side channel attacks and defenses. I really enjoy designing these new attacks because it breaks the incorrect assumptions uh, in the wide community. And I want to mention that even though thinking as an attacker is the first thing we learn from a sec software security class, but as computer hardware architect, it's not common for us to think about breaking the system we built by ourselves. But I think as hardware exploits become more common and popular, it is very important for us, computer architect, to think as an attacker. I have been doing this by designing this new attack and I would like to keep doing this in the future. Also, when I designed this new attack, I find a lot of uh, defense solutions which rely on uh, cache partition do not work for directories. Therefore, my current work is to design secure directories to defeat these new attacks. Here is a short summary of my thesis contributions. I designed uh, a defense solution against the speculative execution attacks, which is robust to future attacks. I also designed a practical defense solution against the cache attacks on inclusive cache hierarchies, and I exp extend attacks into new hardware architectures. Also, I designed a detection mechanism and using existing attacks against uh, using existing attacks on evolving applications. Finally, I would like to thank all my collaborators. They contributed a lot to my work, and I learned a lot from them during the, throughout these many years in my PhD. This is the end of the video. I hope you enjoy watching it, and thank you. Bye-bye.